I'm so excited. Um, this is my sixth WDS, so that means that for about, f well, five years and around eight months, I've been daydreaming about doing a keynote at WDS. <laughs> And, um, and I knew exactly how it was going to go. I knew that I would be sitting on my couch, on my computer, and the email would come in from Chris Gillibo saying, we'd like you to speak at WDS 2019. And I would feel this like explosion of joy bloom in my chest, and it would go out to my fingertips like electricity. And I would stand up and run in the kitchen where my sweetheart is, and I would say, Krista, I have been asked to do a talk at the World Domination Summit. And she would kiss me, and I would know how proud she was from the pressure of her lips. And then <laughs> I always knew that I was going to write a talk just for you guys, just for 2019. And I would set aside time every day to work on it, and I would work on this talk. And then finally, I would come here, and I would get on stage, and from the first word, you guys would just be crying. <laughs> I'm a storytelling and speaker coach, so tears are one of my metrics. So you guys are just like crying the whole talk, and then it finally gets to the end of the talk, and you're still crying. And I say, folks, thank you so much. And you all stand up, and you give me a standing ovation. And then this standing ovation goes on for so long that eventually I just run out and throw myself in the crowd. <laughs> and at this point, you crowd surf me up to the back of the Newmark Theatre, up to the back, then out into the lobby, and then down the stairs, and then outside, where they have brought back from the 2014 closing party Party, the hot air balloon, <laughs> and you, you place me in the hot air balloon, and at this point, the whole city has heard what's happening, and they've come out, and everyone's just like, Marsha, Marsha, while I'm just off into the Portland skies. <laughs> so that's how... <laughs> That's how I thought it was going to go. What actually happened is that I was sat on my couch, on my computer, when the email came through from Chris Gillibo saying, we'd love you to speak at WDS this year. And I didn't feel an explosion of joy. I kind of felt not very much, except for, you know when you take a microphone a little bit too close to the speaker, and before you get that shriek of feedback, you feel that kind of low warning hum. It felt like that. And as the days went on and the weeks went on, I did not set aside time to work on my talk. And one month in, that is when my beast unfurled its tentacles, slithered its way over to me, put its mouth to my ear, and it said, it's been four weeks, and you've done nothing. <laughs> you've been given a massive opportunity, and you're fucking it up. <laughs> 15 years ago, I couldn't have told that story like that, because 15 years ago, I didn't think of my beast as a beast. I just thought of the things that it said as the truth. And the things it said were so much meaner. It told me that I was inherently unlovable. It told me that there was something broken about me and that my family and friends were going to discover this and leave me. It told me that when, when I went on a date and he or she didn't call me back, it was because they'd already figured it out. And today, I'm not going to talk to you about how to get from that place to this, partly because it took years of doing the work and self-reflection and, thank you, privilege, therapy but also because if you're here, my guess is you've already started down that journey and you already understand that what your beast says isn't truth, it's some part of you that's saying it to you. But then you might think, well, if I've done all of this work, why do I still have a beast? If I'm so evolved, why do I say such awful things to myself? And then you realize that you're beating yourself up for beating yourself up. And then you think, oh my God, I'm beating myself up for beating myself up. What is wrong with me? And you realize that you're beating yourself up for beating yourself up for beating yourself up. <laughs> and it just becomes this growing, endless loop. And what I want to tell you today is that if you have a beast whispering in your ear, it does not mean that there's something wrong with you. I believe that having a beast is part of the human condition. And that our aim is not to vanquish that beast. It's not to kill it dead. 
It's just to learn how to reduce the frequency and the volume of its voice. And that when you do that, you can have a nicer life and you can change more lives. And I know that you want both of those things because you are here. I know you don't just want to change more lives because you're not at the nonprofit without joy for 20 years until you burn out and quit the <laughs> sector conference. And I know that you don't just want a nicer life because you're not at the Real Estate Wealth Expo featuring Sly Stallone and Pitbull. <laughs> this is a real photo from a real event. <laughs> a few months after that first WDS, I'm on the phone to my friend Kate, and I am saying, Kate, it is all a lie. They think it's true, but it's all a fucking lie, and it's never going to be true because I'm not capable of this. Kate is someone who I go to these conferences with. We got into the world of self-development at around the same time, and I had started my business a few months before, and I would go to events, and I'd run into people, and they would say, oh my god, Marsha, I've been following you on social media. You are killing it. Congratulations. And I would go, thanks. And so on the phone, Kate said, are you killing it? And I said, no, Kate, no, Kate, I am not killing it. I'm not killing it, and I have no excuse. I know I'm good at what I do. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I have done the courses. I have read the blogs. I have so much opportunity. I have privilege. I'm white. I'm cisgendered. I'm non-disabled. I am queer, but people tend to assume that I'm straight. And I have money set aside. <laughs> happens a lot. I have money set aside to work on this full time, but I sit down to work in the mornings, and I spend all day on the computer, and I get to the end of the day, and I've achieved nothing. Kate had a background in HR, and she said, look, I'm thinking of doing coaching. Why don't you let me do a few sessions with you? You just pay me whatever you can. I can maybe teach you about systems and delegation. And I thought, I've got nothing to lose, so we tried. And the first couple of sessions, I learned about systems, and we learned about delegation, and we looked about where I was spending my time and if I could spend it better. And it was good, but I knew that that wasn't the problem. I have read every productivity hack there is to learn, and they do not stick with me. And then one session, Kate said, I want to talk about your relationship with shame. And I was like, I don't, I don't have a relationship with shame. I didn't like go on feelings Tinder and be like, happiness, mm, <laughs> peace, mm, ooh, shame. <laughs> you look like you'd really erode my self-esteem. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I just feel like every session you end up saying the same things to me. You say, I didn't get anything done, I dicked around all day, I'm a loser. So here's what I want you to do between now and the next session. Next time that happens, I just want you to notice it. And uh, so I said, okay, so the next day, I woke up and I sat down to work and then it got to seven o'clock and I looked at the time and I thought, oh my God, I've dicked around all day, I didn't get anything done, I'm a loser. Ooh. So I noticed it. And the next day, I sat down to work, and I got to the end of the day. Oh my god, I'm a loser. I dicked around. Ah. And I found, for me, it was helpful to actually put it in a corner of the room and just notice it there. And it wasn't that it would start off in the corner of the room. That voice would start off as a roar that was consuming me. But just by turning and going, there you are, shame, it shrunk it down. And it shrunk it down so much that over the coming weeks and months, all the systems, the delegation, that was helpful, but that was the thing that most profoundly changed the way that I worked on my business and that I moved through the world. And I started to have a nicer life and to change more lives. And one of the ways that I did that was by working with people on their stories. And as I worked with entrepreneurs and speakers and executives, I realized this having a beast, this voice in my ear that whispers horrible things, especially when I'm trying to get things done, when I'm trying to make progress and create. It wasn't exclusive to me. And all of these successful, functional, happy people had their own beasts. And I want to show that to you, but also client discretion is important, and I'm pretty good at my job. <laughs> and so instead, um, you might have noticed when you were checking in, in HQ, we had some boards up on the wall where you could write things on Post-it notes anonymously, and we had a few questions. And one of the questions was, what is the horrible voice in your head saying to you right now? So I wanted to show you some of these. 
I don't talk enough. I don't belong here. Somebody smarter than you is going to call you out on your bullshit. You are not deserving. Everything that's gone well is a fluke. So you are not alone, but also we're WDSs. When there's something we don't like, we don't just put up with it, we try and change it. So I'm going to tell you what has worked for me. Four steps. Number one is just notice it. So our beasts tend to have a pretty short playlist of the same two or three songs that they sing to us every day. Um, so I thought I'd show you my beast playlist. Um, <laughs> Song number one, you're a fucking loser. Song number two, I can't believe that you just wasted all that time dicking around on the internet. And a big favorite is you have the potential to really help people, but you'll never get around to it because you're a failure. <laughs> so have a think about what your beast top two or three songs are. And when you hear the beast singing them to you, just notice it. And they don't tend to come as a voice of the beast, it tends to come as truth. And that is the point where you can notice. And for me, I'm a visual person, so it helps me to turn to a corner of the room. Sometimes I'll be like, wow, you have a lot to say for yourself today. <laughs> and just the act of noticing has really helped me shrink. So number two is understand why it's doing what it's doing. I feel like half my brain is like woo-woo in the universe, and the other half of my brain is like science, logic, reason. And it's that part of my brain that's like, why is part of my brain attacking the rest of my brain? And so what I've come to understand is most of the time, our beasts think that they're trying to help us. So there's two parts to this. One is the danger that it thinks it's in. And this can be a multitude of different things. It's going to be different for every single person, and we all have several. Sometimes it's a genuine danger, something that genuinely could happen. Sometimes it's a lesson that we were taught growing up, either explicitly or through modeling. Sometimes it's a lesson we picked up from society, either again, explicitly, or just through lack of representation. And that's one of the reasons representation is so important. So we're not going to go into the reasons why, uh, the reasons why it's afraid, but we can talk about why it has this method. Why is it so mean? And it's because it wants to move you to action or inaction as quickly as possible. Our beasts tend to be quite young parts of ourselves, and kids are often very binary. They're very black or white. So any kind of danger seems like life or death. If you were standing on a train track and there was a train coming towards you that you hadn't seen and I had, I wouldn't like whip out my computer and start writing you an email, hi, I want to inform you that there is a train moving towards you at a velocity of 100. I would just shove you off the tracks and you'd graze your knees, it would hurt you, but I would have saved your life. So that is often what our beast thinks it's doing because our beast knows that shame shuts you down quicker than almost anything else. So say you're at the closing party tonight, and you're single, and you see some super babe, and then you guys are kind of making eyes at each other. The beast doesn't think it has time to say, hey, if you guys keep flirting, you might end up like getting together, and if you get together, you might fall in love, and if you fall in love, then you might break up, and then you might get really hurt, and I don't know if I can handle that hurt for you. It doesn't feel like it has time to, so it just says, you have a face that no one likes, and that shuts you down. <laughs> Because if that's what you believe in the moment, it's really hard to flirt. <laughs> it's the same with this talk. My beast has been so loud as I've been writing this talk. And for sure, there's about a thousand of you here. For sure, there are people in the audience right now who are sitting there going, I don't agree with this. I don't relate to any of it. Just because you have an English accent doesn't mean you're actually smart. <laughs> And that's hard for me. I'm a furious people pleaser. I want everyone to like me. But I also know that there are people in the audience who need to hear this and who this is going to help. And so I'm willing to take that hit. So with all of that information, I can make that decision. So when the beast is being mean, sometimes you want to think, what is the message behind it? And am I OK to push through? So we've had number one, notice. Number two, understand. Number three is acknowledge. And what I want to say here is I'm not telling you to love your beast. 
There are a lot of messages in our world that that's what we should do, like love your beast, like love those voices, give them appreciation. If you can do that, that is amazing. I am not as evolved as you are. Like, if we were in the lobby and you came up to me and went, your dress is stupid and your bangs look weird, I would find it really hard to be like, thank you, I love you. <laughs> I appreciate, so I'm not asking, if you can do that, amazing. If not, I just want you to acknowledge it because that part of your brain is trying to get your attention. And so here's what I do. Again, you don't have to do this out loud. You don't even have to do it as solid words in your head. But for me, I often just in my head will look at a place in the room and say, hey, totally get that you're trying to help me, actually not helping me at all. So I'm just gonna carry on. And at that point, you do number four, which is to push through. And often you haven't silenced the beast in that moment, but you've just reduced the volume to a point where it becomes like the teacher in Charlie Brown, where you're tuning, you know, wah, 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 except it's a beast, so it's more like bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> It's like you have to imagine that um, if your neighbor was really into Norwegian black metal, but to be reasonable, they had turned it down a little bit. And after a while, you just know that it's there and you're able to tune it out and not look at it. <laughs> so I do want to say one thing about the traditional ways that we try and squash the beast. Sometimes we need to sword fight our beast into the next room. So sometimes if you have a presentation coming up or if you have a deadline and your beast is raging in your ear, you need to just shut it up temporarily so that you can get on with whatever you're doing. And I feel like the easiest way to do that is to come up with counter arguments. If you're sitting doing a design project and your beast is going, the client's going to hate everything you do, you can just say, well, actually, the client's really liked all of my other work, so I'm fine, and push on, and that can shut it up. Another thing is remembering things people have said to you. I have a file in my email called Chin Up, where anytime anyone says anything vaguely nice to me, or if I'm honest, and I wasn't planning to tell you this, but I did, if someone who's like a little bit famous replies to a comment that I've written on their blog, I keep that in there as well. And then if my beast is raging, I'll go in and be like, look, beast, all of these people said things. And a final way you can do it is by showing your beast that the stuff it's trying to shame you about, other people do too. So as Chris mentioned, I have a Facebook group called I Don't Have My Ish Together Either. And in there we have, thank you whoever applauded. Um, <laughs> And in there we have, I don't have my ish together Tuesday, and the idea is that you go into that group, and you can read the posts in there even if you're not a member, but you go in and you, if you want to, you post something that genuinely makes you feel a bit ashamed and like you don't have your ish together as an antidote to the rest of Facebook where all of us, me included, are being like, I'm perfect, I'm perfect, I'm perfect. <laughs> my keynote at WDS went amazing. Um, because that's often can have our be sitting there being like, look at everyone else. They never fight with anyone in their family. <laughs> and so, <laughs> by being in the group, you can read posts from people who are doing those things, or sometimes people put up photos like this one, or this one. <laughs> And so just seeing that you're not the only person doing these things can sword fight your beast into the next room. It's not a permanent solution, but it can help temporarily quieten it so you can just push through. Having a beast, I truly think, is part of being a human being. But if you have a beast, you're not alone. Do you remember the post-its I showed you at the beginning? I would love to just revisit those with you and show you who wrote them. I don't talk enough. I don't belong here. Somebody smarter than you is going to call you out on your bullshit. You are not deserving. Everything that has gone well is a fluke. Those people understand that having a beast doesn't have to hold you back. You can reduce its volume and frequency, and you can try those four things, notice, understand, acknowledge, push through. But if that seems too much, just try the first one, just notice it. Maybe tonight when you're at the closing party, 
It might be that your beast comes up and whispers, you're not brave enough to go and talk to that speaker you like. Or maybe you were brave enough, but you said something that was a bit weird. <laughs> Maybe it's when you're making your way home, it's going to say, you were inspired at WDS, but nothing's going to change once you come back. I don't, want it, I don't want that to happen. I don't want your beast to say those things to you, but I just want you to know that if it does, you are not alone. And if it does, there are things that you can do to reduce the volume and the frequency and just push through. And that when you do, you can have a nicer life and you can change more lives. There is one more thing I would like to do before I go. If it's okay with you, I would like to have a chat with your beast. So, if you can, uh, close your eyes if it feels good to you. If not, just lower your head. Hi, beast. It's me, Marsha. <laughs> We've just been talking about you for a half an hour, so you're probably feeling pretty famous right now. Listen, Beast, I totally get that you are trying to help my friend. I totally get that you are. You're actually not helping them right now. So do me a favor. I want you to take a break. Maybe take yourself off to the Beast Spa. Get a little massage for your tentacles. Because my friend has got this. And Beast, one more thing. I am afraid of you. Folks, thank you so much. <laughs>